Yeah, what's up, guys? Kualitonali familia, nintoka Shuteska Tonatiu. Good day, everybody. My name is Shuteska. Grateful to be here and um, appreciate the generous uh, introduction. I'd like to take a second to introduce myself. Um, a little bit of a different, different format. Um, I'm always up too late. I have a fly for hours. International flights, northern lights, and media showers. The media got it all wrong, man, I'll tell you that. The picture that they're painting of me is far from being accurate. Activist with the fish high for the planet, yeah. How about this, I'll lay it out myself. Watch the map, it. yeah, that's X for the crossroads that I face. I from within, the beginning of all change. Written for you, my people, the reason that I rap. I represent your voice in every single track. That's H, higher learning. T for all the teachers. Teaching me to tell a story, get him off the bleachers. Easy, my life has never been. My suffering motivates the stroke of my pen. And CA, the California waves. My Latino family from Diego to the Bay. Viva la raza, la revolución, la pelea de la gente es lo que me inspiró. T for Mexico, Tenochtitlan, jungla de obsidiana, regresará. And L for the miracle of life I've been given. Never fun a kid, this young is so driven. My name is Shuteska, thank y'all for having me. And yeah, thank y'all for coming through like that. Like, make, like, like, make some noise for yourselves for coming out. Yeah. So we got a full room, we got people on the floor. It's lit. <laughs> thank y'all for pulling up. Truly grateful, truly grateful to the staff and the sustainability um, office who so graciously uh, received me and uh, all the students that you know, showed us the hotel and everything. Show us the burrito, <laughs> habanero made with sauce on food. It's about great, great. Uh, my name is Chitez Scott. I have a little bit of a story to share with you guys. Um, and again, like, I'm, I'm stoked to see the full room like that. It's always beautiful to see like, lots of young people coming through to, to you know, be a little bit of a part of this discussion, this dialogue. I'm going to do some questions afterwards. So throughout the discussion, throughout what I have to share, you know, just um, stuff pops in your head. Like, Please feel free to share. Always encouraging the youth to speak up and uh, continue the dialogue. I uh, <coughs> start, I guess, with a uh, poem that my, that my father uh, showed and, and taught me when I was a little boy. My father is, um, is Mexica, is indigenous Mexican. Uh, so I grew up very close to my traditional roots, very close to my uh, close uh, to my kind of cultural ancestry. That's a very significant part of my upbringing. And what I learned from my father is, is he, he told me this poem that says, Te nishkayuta tu suchini, te nishkayuta tu bugame. Por lo menos sacamos flores, por lo menos sacamos cantos. At the least we have left flowers, at the least we have left songs. And I was like, yo, what does that mean? I was like five, six years old when he first taught this to me. He said, that is one of the last, um, one of the last poems that one of the great poets of our people left behind. And this was at the time of our colonization when Spain came and conquested and uh, took over our people's territories and lands. Uh, and what the poem is talking about is that in a world where many things are impermanent, uh, where all things fade, where you know, our empire, uh, our, our cities and our buildings you know, were, were being taken from us, where we look at cities get left behind, people get forgotten. The thing that is, that is permanent and that can last forever is our legacy is you know, the sacred, the culture that we, that we pass on in the hearts and the minds of people that allows us to carry on that which our ancestors started. <coughs> and he would teach me that, you know, our ancestors fought and struggled a lot so that we could be here right now, so we could have a voice, so we could come, continue to preserve our culture and our language, so we could protect our land and our clean water for future generations. Um, and so from a very young age, I, I saw myself in this, in this context of having a responsibility to carry on the work that my ancestors that came long before me had started. Um, and at the same time, you know, he told us that we have a responsibility to continue that for future generations. And we, are, we are the present generation that has to carry on a legacy for those to follow. So I've always seen and found myself kind of in that, in that midway point between the past and the future. And uh, as a very little kid, you know, this is an interesting sense of responsibility that I found myself with. My mother, Shout out to my mom. My mother had been incredibly uh, involved in the environmental movements, organizing and mobilizing young people across the country. I grew up very uh, aware from that perspective as well. I didn't really go to school until I was like 10 years old. I spent all my time either in San Juan with my father or, or out in nature with my family, you know, just like 
connected and dropped in with the earth. Um, and I saw this documentary called The Eleventh Hour. So they know the camera documentary. This documentary depicted the state of the planet and it showed uh, cities, cities being washed away into the ocean because of rising tides. Tropical storms showed how humans were responsible for the catastrophes that we were seeing in our environment, our climate. And as like a little kid, I was devastated. You know, except when I watched this. And I looked at my mom, I was like, Mom, how can, how can uh, people live their lives every single day and not think about this? How can people go to school every day, go to work every day, and not have this in the back of their mind, not think about the fact that, that our lifestyle, our choices, the way we are choosing to live is the short planet. From that moment on, I recognize like, this is part of, of, of my responsibility to my ancestors and to the future generations to fight to protect what is left, um, to fight to, to understand my role and my place in all of this. Um, and thus begin like this crazy journey uh, of mine that, that has taken me in many places across the planet, including here. I'm incredibly grateful to be here speaking to the United Nations, giving TED Talks. One thing that I learned about this is that it was so much more than the story that had been depicted to me in that, in that documentary. When I think about climate change, you know, when I watched this, I thought about climate change, you know, the, the picture was very clear for me was uh, sea caps, or ice caps melting, sea levels rising, polar bears drowning, extinction of species, kind of the, the stereotypical idea of, of how we do global warming and climate change in the world. And that was very real for me until I, recognized that climate change had much larger implications than that. And it took it for, for, for uh, a long time, you know, my, my perspective continued to evolve and change. I started seeing the way that climate change was affecting my home, and my community. You know, the top slide is, a, is, is an image from, from some of the wildfires that we experienced in Colorado. That from the age of like 10 to 13, 14, every single year we were having record-breaking wildfires, time and time again. With you know, the short and more and more acreage of forest that I loved and I had spent my childhood growing up visiting and going to. Um, and the bottom side is, is an image of a, a really intense flood we had in 2013 that washed away my basement. Um, the, the many of my friends' homes were, were severely damaged. Where a year after the flood, me and my school went up to uh, one of the mountain towns that was still repairing and still recovering from this flood. There's still debris all throughout the waterway. And, like, landscapes that I grew up visiting my entire childhood were totally rerouted and reconstructed. And it got me thinking, like, this climate, this environment thing is so much bigger than, than, uh, than just greenhouse gases. It's so much more than just the way we, we choose to see it. Um, for me, personally, as, as a young person, this is the taste of the kind of future that we are being left behind because of the decisions, decisions of not just politicians, but the consumers, the people that are just living our lives every single day, you know, without the awareness that we do, which is out of effect everything. I think part of what I continue to see is that climate change is a human issue. Climate change was something that, that was affecting people. Um, looking at by the end of the century, we're looking to have like a billion climate refugees. A billion people that have been displaced by climate change. You know, for myself, watching the news and, and looking at uh, what had happened in Puerto Rico, what had been happening with these different tropical storms across the United States, you know, friends of mine who have lost their homes in California due to wildfires. Looking back at, at how this is affecting people that I love and places that I love, continues to show the context of like this is so much bigger than we recognize. And then you look at the people that are disproportionately impacted by this crisis, you know, I see my people, I see indigenous populations of people that are living at the equator that are being displaced and affected by climate change more so than anybody. I see black and brown people being affected more than anybody. Um, and for us, I think it's, it also points to this, this great sense of uh, disconnect that we have when we view issues and, and, and like to separate ourselves from and I like to think that like a lot of people have lost kind of a sense of connection to the humanity of our climate crisis. Um, because it's easier to be disconnected from something that is overwhelming us, as a global crisis that threatens life on Earth. Um, and for me, what I saw is that at the root of a lot of this was this idea of disconnect. <coughs> that in our culture, that we can see it through, at the root of many of the different issues that are affecting our communities and, and our people. I saw that at the root of, of climate change because I feel that people have lost a sense of connection to the planet. That as a little kid, I was running around the forest and I was catching frogs and snakes and I was like kind of oblivious to the crisis of the world because I was just like busy being in love with nature. 
And when I finally went to school when I was 10, I thought everybody was like that. And I saw like parents didn't really raise their kids that way. It was a little bit like shocking for me. Um, the, the younger generation wasn't being raised to have that same kind of like, empathy or connection for nature. I feel like I see the disconnection that my generation made youth have to themselves. I think that that ties to everything from anxiety to apathy to depression to suicide and different issues that affect myself and my people and my community. I think at the root of that is this disconnection from self. And I look at, you know, the, the, the crisis that we have when we look at how people treat each other from racism and bigotry to, to those, those forms of injustice to sexism to homophobia. Like, I think that's a disconnection from one another as human beings, this association. We look at the way we treat our food, you know, or we consume, we consume food like we're a car that's just like pulling over and putting fuel in our car and like continue going without really thinking like, where did that food come from? What is the impact of the food that we're eating? Where does it go once we're done? And I think kind of these different lines of, 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 of disconnect that our cultural has, we have like culturally made so normal um, are at the roots of, of many of these different problems that we see around us. And I think that one of the biggest things we need to do is begin to reestablish these senses of like these ideas of connection to the world and to one another and to ourselves. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we have made is the presentation and the story, the narrative around these issues. Well, when I was like first getting involved in, in, in climate change and these different movements, um, I found myself pulling up to these different climate rallies and marches and it was just myself, this one you know, little brown long haired boy and a, a, a lot of old white people and so much love and respect to all my old white people. <laughs> but, um, but at, at the same time, I recognized a lack of diversity within the movements that made it so we weren't progressing in the right ways and there wasn't a diversity of ideas that were brought to the table, a diversity of representation of the communities that were actually being impacted by these environmental and climate issues. Um, and so, and I also saw a lack of young people. I'm stoked to see so many youth in the room again. Like, you know, I, I speak at colleges very often and not always is there this much of like a, an interest to engage in this kind of conversation. So thank y'all for pulling up for real. Again, like, I'm stuck to be here. And so what I saw is there was this necessity to like change this narrative. This narrative of, of climate science and atmospheric CO2 is very, like the information and the knowledge and the science behind it are absolutely critical pieces to understand. But at the same time, that's not what reaches people's hearts. That's not necessarily what inspires people to act or change or get involved or be invested or connected to something. So I recognize that, that this narrative has to shift. This narrative has to shift if we want to get people involved. Because we look outside of the world around us, from the storms we're seeing around the country today, to the future projections of what we're going to see, and the way that climate change affects everything, this is one of the most pressing issues of our time. You see the way that it affects the ability to access education, access good food. It's a, it's a very serious thing that needs to be taken very seriously. And to that extent, you know, I looked at like, okay, so who are the, the archetypes currently that we associate with this movement? And I heard you guys had Bill McKibben come and speak previously. Bill McKibben is one of the kind of archetypes we recognize with this. Al Gore, um, Naomi Klein, like these are some of the people that we associate with the faces of this movement. And I know for a fact that many of those archetypes aren't reaching young people, aren't inspiring young people in the same way that we need to, aren't reaching out to communities of color. And so therefore, archetypes are also a representation of a transition that needs to happen to pass the power back into the, to the younger generation. Because they are the faces that are known, but they are not the only people that are standing up and fighting for change and that are doing incredible things in the space of climate and the environment. I'm not the only young person out there doing this kind of thing. You know? And that's one cool thing that I see is when I travel to colleges and universities all across the country to like random rural parks in the middle of nowhere in Georgia or Minnesota or New York is, is there are people that are inspired, that feel this transition that is coming away from this narrative to a space where we can reclaim our story. I recognize the story of our climate crisis is something that affects and ties each and every one of us together. This reclamation of story I saw so present at a, at, at a Standing Rock camp that happened in North Dakota. When I, when I put up the Standing Rock, um, I, was, I was very uh, blessed to be able to go and perform with my brother Michael Bear and Mortal Technique handful of other very talented artists to bring celebration and music to the movement. But what I saw when I went to Standing Rock wasn't a bunch of you know, activists protesting fossil fuel extraction. That was definitely a component, but I saw 
grandmothers and grandfathers. We would go to the front lines of this pipeline and would sing songs and, and offer prayers to the police on the other side. We would see children riding around the encampment on horseback. We would see women and men cooking meals for, for hundreds of people. What was there, I think, was these people are sending off tapped into this deep humanity um, that is oftentimes forgotten. That for them, it wasn't just about the pipeline. For them, it was about clean water. You know, for these people are sending off, it was about preserving and protecting their land and their culture. This pipeline was a representation of the oppression that has existed towards indigenous peoples for the last 500 plus years. That had manifested itself into a pipeline that was threatening the clean water of yet another tribe. They first proposed this pipeline to be put in a, in a rural white community. Um, when the white people said they wouldn't want the pipeline, they didn't want the tribal lands. You know? And so uh, this pipeline represented a lot more than just um, a greedy fossil fuel corporation. It, it, it represented a, an entire system of injustice that we saw from the police brutality that we saw out there um, to kind of the disconnect from the media, the media failing to represent the stories of the people out here corporatization of the media that didn't want the story to get out and be told. And thankfully for social media, like we were able to spread the message uh, enough to get thousands and thousands of people mobilized here to help stop this pipeline. And it's really interesting being out there, like you felt, felt a different energy because the indigenous peoples that, that, call, that put the call to action out, they, they gathered tribes and nations from all over the world that had not been together in the same space before. It is something that we had never seen in Indian country or, or in the world for that matter. And the crazy thing that people don't often know is that Standing Rock was started by young people. Standing Rock was started by a group of kids with an organization called um, One Mind. It was an anti-suicide, it was a suicide prevention organization. These young people, if you don't know, the, the suicide rate on reservations and on, is on tribal land is over double the national average, especially amongst young girls. So there's a huge problem with disconnecting the colonization that still exists in these communities. So this organization, young people that were working in the suicide profession heard about this pipeline that was being put through their land. They put a call to action out to the world and nobody listened. And they said, all right, the adults are going to support us. The elders in our community are going to support us. So we're going to do a run. They ran from Standing Rock down to Washington, D.C. to demand that people come together and help them protect their tribal land. And by the time they got to Washington, D.C., they were collecting petition signatures all across the way, being hundreds of thousands of petition signatures, stopping in different tribal reservations. By the time they got to Washington, D.C., they began the development of the infrastructure. I'll stand here off. So they ran back to their homeland. And through that, through that journey from, from Standing Rock to D.C., back to Standing Rock, they got the call out. And thousands and thousands of people began to mobilize and come together and show up to this encampment. And it was a, a really turbulent, crazy energy. Um, and a lot was really powerful and really beautiful, and a lot was really dark. We learned a lot from Standing Rock. One of the important things is they built the pipeline. The pipeline has now spilled into their waterway. Um, they evicted the, the encampment. Many people were unjustly uh, put, into, put into jail and unjustly charged with um, many different uh, crimes that they didn't commit, trying to put people that did absolutely nothing other than protest uh, in prison for a long time. There's a lot of legal battles that are still happening right now to try to help free these people who were unjustly convicted. Um, but one thing that did happen at Standing Rock is during the 12 plus months of the existence of that encampment, there was not one suicide on the Standing Rock Reservation. And that's unprecedented, you know? And, and what I think is really beautiful about that, and, and that feels like a win for me, because I've been to these different reservations and these different places from Pine Ridge to Hopi Land, pull up and you hear stories from just the other day, two little girls took their lives. You know? Like this is such a regular thing that happens for these communities and for these people. And the fact that that kind of mobilization, that kind of energy helped save many lives, literally, is like absolutely uh, a sign that this is the right thing to do. Because what happened at Standing Rock is we redistributed the power and gave the power back to the young people. I think this is a, is a clear example of, of people reclaiming their story and reclaiming their narrative in a space where we said we are not going to allow our story to be defined by these fossil fuel corporations, by these politicians that failed to stand up for us. That as young people, we are here to change the story. 
and giving in as you, and as you shop, like giving that power back into the hands of young people, reconnection to, to purpose, to connection, to giving them a voice. So many young people feel voiceless, so many young people feel hopeless, so many young people feel apathetic and disconnected from these crises because we're constantly pushing and talking about the problems and, and, and everything wrong with the world without really offering the solutions or without really talking to these young people about how, about how they can create a change and create an impact. And I think like this is a beautiful representation of how movements are beginning to transition towards uplifting the generations of people that need to be heard. And this has been a, a, a wild journey that has taken me many places, and one of which has been um, into a lawsuit where myself and 20 other young people are suing the federal government for violating our constitutional rights to life, liberty, and property for failure to protect our future from climate change. And this is a really interesting thing because what I think we see with Standing Rock and with this lawsuit in different places, when I stand up on this stage and I not only speak but I rap, this is us reclaiming the space and saying that we are not going to allow the movements to fight for justice be defined just by activism that there are so many ways in which we have to engage in our culture and in our society that are deeper than just the traditional methods of activism that are necessary to create change, that are necessary to inspire and influence a generation. And um, this lawsuit was one of these things where like, we're asking us, how do we diversify the tactics? How do we think outside the box? How do we do something that it has not been done before? And in 2015, when the Obama administration was in power, Myself and these other young people filed this lawsuit in partnership with an organization called Our Children's Trust. And it was people out there, why did you sue Obama? Like, he was you know, a, a hero for the environment. Um, in a lot of ways, yes, Obama did some really dope things, but at the same time, he opened up more federal land for natural gas extraction than any other president in history. Um, the stance that he took to say no to the Keystone XL pipeline, which is a detrimental fossil fuel infrastructure project wasn't something that he just came up with and did out of the kindness of his heart. It was years and years and years of pressure and protest from the world, from our communities. So uh, at that time, even when Obama was in office, our climate continued to fall into a space of disarray. And we recognized, like, as young people, we need to have our voices heard within, not just, not just in the streets, not just in the political systems by calling our candidates, or by calling our, our politicians, but also in the courts. We look back to the social justice movements throughout history, the civil rights movement, young people took to the courts to demand justice. And we look at movements throughout history, young people have taken to the courts, and this was the first time young people took to the courts to fight for our economy, to fight for our future in this way. And the crazy thing is this is a balance of the stories of these 21 young people. You can't see it super well, but like, what is he? There's a little kid named Levi, who is 10 years old, and he's the youngest kid that is a plaintiff on this lawsuit. He's from Florida, and his story is talking about how his community is being displaced because of rising sea levels. Every one of these kids up here that is suing the government has a story behind their lives about how they are actively being impacted by climate change and why has our government res responsibility to help to reverse the crisis that they have created by supporting the very industries that have created the climate crisis. So there's stories, it's the science, we're working with the top climate scientists uh, in the country to help create a, a, a diagnosis for a climate recovery plan to be put into place to reverse the crisis that we have created over the last several decades. And we're working with the, with the judicial system, with, with the legal system, to help implement our voice. And so after like three, four years of, of, of fighting, first of all, a transition over the Trump administration, and a couple of differences that that made, first of all, it's far more satisfying to say that we're suing Trump than it is to say that we were suing Obama. And at the same time, he's trying to do all kinds of crazy stuff in his lawsuit, trying to remove factual evidence from a court hearing, tried to remove uh, uh, allowing us to, to call expert witnesses to testify, um, trying to make it so that the, the plaintiffs, the young people that fought the lawsuit can't testify. And every single time, the judges that have been given the power to decide have been like, bro, what are you doing? It's literally not allowed. So Trump's trying to rewrite the rules and we're telling him no. And, judges that are making decisions on this case are telling them. So finally, after three years, we are literally going to court. We are going to trial, October 29th, which is a massive win for our generation, for the movement, for everybody who has been hustling to make this movement move. Odds are stacked against us, and it's very difficult, but the fact that we made it this far is like, um, you know, people are calling us a trial, essentially. Um, and it's, 
It's inspiring to be a part of, of an energy and a momentum. We see young people doing stuff, many, many thought that many doubted us, doubted our ability to do and create and build. And this is a reflection and a, uh, a representation, I think, also of what young people are standing up and doing across the country. And, and a privilege of mine to be able to speak at many colleges and connect with many young people to see and recognize the incredible work that is being done on an individual level. Or, or on a community level in different spaces all over the place. Um, and this is, I think, a manifestation of like powerful energy that has been brewing within our movement, within our generation, that we are ready to show the world. And the diversification of the tactics continues with my own platform and using that to infiltrate mainstream media. Whether it's been like my opportunity to speak on Bill Maher, or The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, or like this one right here, I was on something called Skavlan, which is like the biggest talk show in Scandinavia like Norway, Sweden, Finland, and they were all speaking in, in, in Norwegian, and then they would ask me a question in English. I don't really know what they were saying, but I got the opportunity to have a really dope platform out in Scandinavia to talk to all these Scandinavian people and tell them stuff. You know, and then, and then you know, the book that I wrote, which is really exciting to hear that it's been utilized as curriculum, you know, in some of the different classes here. So it's like part of that, that like reclamation of, of, of my own narrative in the space of climate light. How can we step outside of that small bubble of people that come to your events every single week? The people that always come through. You know, the people that are, yeah, like your, your, your regular mailing list for people to, to shout out to come to the community actions. Like how do we go broader than that? How do we recognize that this, not only this crisis, but this movement needs to reach like, all facets of culture? And that's where like my music comes in as well. Because I recognize that speaking, has a certain impact on people. But then when I started to play shows like this in front of like tens of thousands of people, and through my music and through my voice, share that story, like, it shifts the energy. You know, it's very different than getting out and, and delivering a keynote speech. And even when I was a little kid and I was just like rapping out the protests, like for all these, all these people that, that would go and they would protest and they would chant and they would hold the signs and do the same thing, all of a sudden me and my little bro, he was six and I was like nine, we're going, we would start spinning bars, and they were like, why? Everybody like, it like brought it just a different energy into the space, you know? And then I started playing shows, festivals, I started, like, I went and rapped at the UN, I started doing things in Paris, like all over the place, and carrying this message through the music in a different way. If you look at where hip hop comes from, in the Bronx, in the late 70s, it was born out of a response for a community that was left behind by the rest of New York, and left behind by much of the world whose voices were not heard. When these people had an important story and a voice that needed to be shared, it wasn't taken into consideration by much of the people um, that had almost pushed them to the side. Young kids who didn't have anything would put their name on a wall. That's how it began. There's many elements of hip hop and it began with tagging their name on an old building to feel ownership over something. And this was taught to me by my teachers, by, by my grandmasters and my, my hip hop gurus that have taught me this ways. And, you know, talking about how then all of a sudden we began to gather in house parties. And young people would come together at block parties and house parties. And DJs started just spinning the cuts, just, just spinning the brakes of a track. And then, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, an MC would come up and they would start spinning and telling a story and rapping. And there were rap battles and there were dance battles. And there was a way that the culture of these communities began to shift. Where it was from a place of uh, a lot of violence and a lot of... Uh, Negativity where young people began to get onto a stage or come to these parties and express themselves in a way and battle one another in a way that wasn't violent. Um, and, and you look at different artists throughout history that have created art that represents their times. Music has always been a tool for storytelling for revolution. Whether it's John Lennon or Bob Marley or Rage Against the Machine or Kendrick Lamar, like artists have this platform and this ability to talk to people and connect to people in a way that many others do not. And so recognizing the power of this music has been one of the most inspiring things of, of my entire life. Because for myself, when I ask myself, like, when people ask me, you're like, what? Why do you get up and do this every day? I, I've been hustling since I was six, when I first got onto a stage to talk about this. And it's been the last nine years of, of, of non-stop energy. Um, like, a lot, a lot of energy being put toward all this. Last 12 years, what am I saying? Last 12 years of doing this. And what I recognize too is like there have been different moments where I felt really depressed about the world. It's a lot, it's a lot of weight to carry, it's a lot of weight to hold on to every single day and think about all the time. 
and the music helped me find my way. Music became my expression and my opportunity to reclaim my story, even just within the space of a violence list, and find a unique way that I was inspired to connect to the world, to connect to people. When I sat down and wrote a verse, or when I got to a mic in a recording studio and was able to share that, um, or step onto a stage and rap for, you know, 20 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, that was just like me reclaiming my, my, my space. What I've seen time and time again is like, young people need to be reminded that this movement is about so much more than just activism in the environment. Where when it comes to us reclaiming narrative and reclaiming space, that means that all of us have a part to play. That means that all of us have to remind ourselves of whatever lane it is that we are in in our lives. We have a responsibility to engage with these movements. And it, it can be really simple. You don't have to sue the government. You don't have to dedicate 12 years of your life to it. But what I, what I saw is with you know, studying these different revolutionary artists, it's like, they didn't step outside of their comfort zone to do what they do. They do what they do as artists, and that inspires people to go out and change the world. You know, Tupac said it, I'm not gonna quote him exactly, but he said that he doesn't know if he's gonna change the world, but he knows the lyrics of this song are gonna inspire the person that goes out and does it. And it's a beautiful thing to, to, to see our place in the world like that, because in this movement and in this space, people take themselves too seriously. As a six and seven year old kid, I took myself way too seriously. I needed to chill out so hard. And I finally did, I finally figured it out a little bit. But it was really interesting to see that like, there's a really serious connotation when it comes to, like, like, like uh, the picture that they use for me on the posters. It looks so like, serious, it's, like stoic, and, hey, um, you know, and it's, it's a dope photo. And I, I mean, with my team sent it to them, so it's not like I'm, I'm not mad about it, but. Um, I think that there needs to be kind of a shift in the energy that we feel. Like, yes, we should show up and fill the auditorium and have the, the, the dialogue and the discussion around this moment, but we should also be turning up for the climate. We should also be hosting like block parties and keep people out in the streets dancing and celebrating. We should be bringing the artists together in the community. We should be inspiring the visual artists who can come and create murals on the walls and, and create you know art that is going to be revolutionary. Like the entrepreneurs and business owners, there is so much more to this movement that is often seen and is often celebrated. And for me, that's the parts of it that I'm the most excited to explore and to be a part of and to share with you guys. One of the most significant stories that I want to leave with you tonight is the story of the Earth Guardians. And man, this story is, is, is very inspiring to me. Um, it began with my mother who moved to the Hawaiian Islands when she was I think 18 and 19, she grew up in the streets in Denver um, with a very you know, dysfunctional lifestyle um, and, and a really just like a lot of intensity in her life. And she came to, to Maui, Hawaii, and she walked down into Haleakala Crater, which is one of the sacred volcanoes on, on Maui. And she had this vision of young people standing up across the planet and all these sacred sites to change the world, to protect our earth. And it was this vision that she then took into action by starting an accredited high school in the Hawaiian Islands. And she started a high school that was all uh, centered around preservation of the environment, around community organizing, around inspiring young people to use their voice and use their passion to create change. And all of a sudden, one of the local events invited youth out to, to write a song and perform it. So all of a sudden, these young people were writing songs, writing rap songs, choreographing hip hop dance, and they were starting to play at different community events and shows around the Hawaiian Islands, which then led them to do a tour across the United States, 26 states carrying the torch of hope, which was given and delivered to them by the Dalai Lama. So they were carrying this torch across the United States and they were doing things kind of like this, coming and speaking at different high schools and colleges and telling their story and talking about the movement um, and performing and sharing hip hop. And every stop of the, uh, of the tour, there were young people that would be so down with it and so inspired and so on fire that they would hop on the tour bus and they would go with them to the next city. And my grandpa was driving the tour bus and my mom was running the show. And this was like my older sisters and my cousins that were all the Earth Guardians back in the day. We called us the first generation of Earth Guardians. They were just running things across the country. That's what my mom and my dad met. That's what brought my parents together. Um, and the legacy thing kind of like settled in Boulder, Colorado, where my older sister Issa carried the, the momentum and the energy of Earth Guardians locally, like in, in my hometown. So I was this little kid, three, four, five, six years old, who was growing up surrounded in revolution and movement. 
My sister was speaking to hundreds of high school students all the time, educating them about the environment, doing campaigns to get plastics out of our schools, uh, single-use plastics out of grocery stores, and I was I like grew up just around that, like you know sneaking in and like spying on her and her friends that were doing the thing, and like, they would set me up at the booths when they were trying to raise funds and do educational things because I was like cute little long hair, like five-year-old kid, um, and it was it was just like so innate in my in my space. And I think the, the powerful thing of Earth Guardians, it was, it was never just specifically about the environment. It wasn't just an environmental organization. Um, but what it did is it gave young people a voice and a platform to be able to connect to their community and connect to the world. And I tapped into that when I was nine because um, I heard about in our community they were about to start spraying even more chemicals and pesticides on, on all the parks than they already were. And it was a small thing, and at the time, I was after I'd already been aware of my climate change, I felt very overwhelmed and didn't know what to do, how to get involved. And so this like, small, simple community issue came up, and I was like, you know what, we gotta do something about it. And so I was like, Mom, like, let's, like, let's assemble the squad. Like, let's ca call all your homies, like, all of your friends, tell them to, to like, tell their kids to come through. And so we like, built this little team, like maybe 11, 12, 13 kids from the ages of six. My little brother was the youngest, like 13. And we threw a press conference in front of the city hall. <laughs> All the young people were speaking and talking about how this, this environmental, uh, this was an environmental disgrace to be putting chemicals in the parks where the young kids were playing. And then we went up into the city council. My brother spoke and I spoke. My brother was so small, they had to actually bring a little stool for him to stand on so he could reach the podium. And he said, <laughs> I remember so clearly, he was like, I shouldn't be here. He was like, you are not doing your job of protecting me from the harmful pesticides, so I have to come here to tell you how to do your job. <laughs> and, and they were like, oh, snap. <laughs> they, were, they were not ready for that. <laughs> and we became regulars, like we kept going back. And we, we got pesticides banned in our local parks, in our local parks. Uh, we got plastic bags banned at the local grocery stores. We worked on everything from fracking to GMOs to protecting our open space land to shutting down coal-fired power plants by doing like huge bike rides across the city. And it was like this, this was some of the dopest times of my life because that, that became like my friend group, the, the Earth Guardians. That was the third generation of Earth Guardians was born at that time. And this energy of us feeling empowered, feeling like our voices matter, feeling like coming out to these events and having the youth show up and represent our generation was an important thing. Like going into the schools and talking to other kids about this and growing through our border and like getting more people on board, it was beautiful. It was like a beautiful opportunity for us to, to, to reclaim that power. And all of a sudden, due to social media, the story started to get out. And people started hitting us up from everywhere, from, from Indonesia to the Philippines to Australia and Brazil and across Latin America, across Europe, across the United States. They're like, yo, how do we start an Earth Guardian crew? How do I get involved? How do I implement this, uh, this platform and this, this uh, formula to my community? And these were all young kids that saw that energy of these young people being in a place of power. And we were hungry for that. The world and the young people in the world were hungry for that. So Earth Guardians transitioned from being a local organization in my hometown where we like buckled down. We became a team that was then creating the infrastructure to be able to support a global network of young people fighting for justice all over the place. And in the last, what, and as my voice continued to grow, as I began to do more things, the interviews with Rolling Stone and, and and speaking at the United Nations and giving TED Talks, and my voice expanded, so did the Earth Party movement, and so did this infectious energy, because everywhere that I would go that I would talk about this, people would get more and more inspired and excited. In the last like, three, four years, we now have 264 active Earth Guardian crews in 44 countries. You know, like that's the momentum and the energy that has been growing from this idea that my mom had in 92 in Maui before I was born. And like, we got young kids like my, like my guy Mensa from Togo, Africa, who has started Earth Guardian crews in nine countries. And, 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 and his, his situation, his community is, is living in extreme poverty with very little access to even internet or resources or any of these things. And he has mobilized his community. And they do massive training where they bring together hundreds of students of all ages and train them on how to protect the environment. And then they go out and they plant trees in arid desert environments that had once had like thriving forests and they go and they take care of them. And he now got Earth Guardians recognized as a government organization by the Togolese government. He has a vision to start Earth Guardian crews in every African country by 2020. And this is one kid that is mobilizing and inspiring an entire continent. We got girls in, in, across India that are doing theater performances and flash mobs in the streets to educate about water potability and clean water and teaching kids the importance 
of preservation of our clean waterways. You know, we got like young artists that are writing songs, young, young uh, entrepreneurs that are creating their businesses, young fashion uh, designers that are doing their thing that are also creating sustainable fashion lines out of like reused back mats and computer laptop um, keyboards. Like just people are just getting so creative with it just within our network. You know, I look around at my generation and I see that within the minds of our people, of all of us, are every solution that we need to help bring forward the world that we want. And I can see that just in the impact that I've seen my generation in this moment of the Earth Guardians have worldwide. And everywhere I go and every, more, every time I meet more inspired young people, I see that. That within the darkness and the collapse and the crisis of our world, young people are rising up. And the transition that needs to happen, that needs to happen, is from a space of giving the power back to the young people. Of building an intergenerational movement where we work with all the adults, where we work with our faculty, with our teachers, with our local government, with our federal government. We build partnerships with businesses and companies and corporations, but it's led by the young people. That's like, the, the, I'm very clear about that piece of the vision that young people have to be leading the way. And there is no better time to be alive than now. The last several years have been very difficult. Um, and for me, as a, as, a, as a young brown person, as, as, a, as a, a Mexica, as a Latino youth, as an indigenous youth, seeing this array of our political system within this country and the oppression and the injustice that is existing still today, it's proof that there is so much profound work that needs to be done to deconstruct these systems of oppression that are not only destroying the planet, but are oppressing our people worldwide. And I've seen that everywhere I go that there is like the tides are rising, that the world is changing, and we have no choice but to remain hopeful. And I think losing hope is something we cannot afford. I think if we lose hope and we turn away from this issue, we are turning our back on all the people that have lost their lives already through the climate change, all future generations, and we will not turn our back on those people. I firmly believe that our generation is going to be the generation that changes the tides. I think we're one of the last generations that will have the opportunity to. Things are changing so drastically. I think we're one of the last generations that will have the opportunity to change things soon enough to reverse the damage that has been done. Um, and it's a heavy thing. And it's a very challenging time and space. And what I've seen is that you know, young people across the planet that I've connected with, many of which are in very apathetic states of being, being in high school, having friends in high school, I've seen it like lots of my, my peers are very apathetic and disconnected. Um, and at the same time, there are so many young people that are hungry for an opportunity and a place to share their voice and share their passion. And just in the world we live in currently, there's not necessarily space for that. The older generations and many people don't hold space for young people in the way that we need to. But one of the most important things that adults can do is listen to the youth. And the most important things that youth have to do is recognize our power. Recognize the overwhelming power that we have to create and change. When you look at history, you look at different movements that have influenced change throughout the time. It's like, Many of that has come from young people reclaiming our power in this space. And like we are facing that crossroad again, where culture needs to shift, and that's going to be influenced by the people. When culture shifts, and, then, and everything else is going to follow. So whether you are, you know, regardless of what you're studying, and it was cool, I got to speak to some of the different classrooms earlier today. I got to kick it with some of the young people in, in the sustainability program at lunch, and, and you know, some of the kids in, in uh, and we were looking at uh, you know, environmental politics, environmental science class during the beginning of the day. They were saying like, yeah man, we have these conversations around sustainability in the classroom, but it's hard to like keep that energy alive throughout the rest of our day. Because you know, we take many classes in many different you know, areas, and, and oftentimes uh, those conversations that are very important and sometimes inspire us don't leave the classroom. And that's one thing that we need to make greater effort to really recognize that even coming together in a space like this, it's beautiful that so many people showed up, but it's your responsibility to take a piece of this with you. Whether it's a little bit of information, hope, knowledge, inspiration, ideas, take a piece of that with you, distribute it, and plant those seeds in your community, in your home, share it with the homies, take it to your classes, put it in the group chat, like all that. So, so the energy and, and can continue to grow 
the momentum can continue to grow. I think one of the most important things is like, it's time to take back the space for this movement to recognize that creating changes is about putting ourselves in a box. It says, this is what it looks like to be an activist, this is what it looks like to get involved with the community, this is what it looks like to, get cha to create change, and like, you have to subscribe to that. Because that turns people off and it shuts people down. And I think one of the, one of the most important things is that we have to realize that the diversity of our generation, that we are existing currently in the world as the most diverse generation in history, the most educated generation in history, the least racist generation in history, the most progressive generation in history, we are the best generation equipped, we are the, the generation in history that is best equipped to deal with the crisis the world faces today. Our uh, ability to access technology, information, and global community gives us an incredible advantage over past generations to do the work that is so necessary. And we all have a part to play, whether we are entrepreneurs or students or teachers, whether we are activists or poets or hip hop artists, whether we are CEOs of a business, whether we are lift drivers, all have a part to play in bringing the change and bringing the momentum and the movement into the intersection. And really breaking it down and saying, like, how does this movement apply to me and how can I apply myself to the world? In a way, you don't have to drastically change your life. You can just like implement some of these simple, small things into your life. And as I said, it's not about suing the government. It's not about dedicating your whole life to this. Because we need everybody on board. You know, we need the artists, we need the innovators, we need the thinkers, we need the builders. There is a whole lot that we are going to continue to face down the road. And I believe in the power that our generation has to shape that in the way that we want it to. Um, and I wanted to close with the, the spoken word piece, if that was OK. Um, that cool? All right. Um, it was like this. Like, we sing it with our hands held high. We exist for this resistance with our flags held high. Tipping points are behind us. We watch the tides rise, drawn to divide and conquer. We reach the cross lines. We're searching for a sign that it's not too late. That every day that I fought for is not in vain. There's one letter in my name for every year that I've sacrificed. A good kid in a mad world. But there's fires in the eyes of a young boy. Watching the world up in flames fall away. Tears running like rivers towards the ocean. Trying to speak my truth, but I'm choking. Passing me the torch and I was born into a world already broken. My brother's losing hope and I'm still hoping. See, he can see, he can see the silence inspired. The world is set with its emotion. No matter the adversity we face, the greater the challenge, the higher we rise to fight for change. And you don't even need a microphone to lead the nation. Giving up's not an option, but nobody said this struggle will be painless. It's never been easy. We need the dark to see the stars. The sun matters the most when it stops raining. It's written on our banners and our walls. Break free. The way that the world's not enough to break me, to break you down out of systems, what it takes to reach breakthrough. You can't let the pain of the sinister world break you. You see, rappers ain't the only ones to chase paper. Politicians play the role of leading, but leadership's at an all-time low. Follow the dollar, rigged elections and phony bills, executive orders, reinforced borders where oil spills, crisis, crash the nation, real issues drowned by entertainment. He don't stand for people, his whole agenda is soaked in hatred. Putting these stories in my verse is how I document it. Fearing for my people because they label us undocumented. We haven't seen an end to oppression and violence. Rubber bullets, metal shrapnel, followed by silence. Meant to protect people, not police, have turned militant. Citizens resisting this incident are innocent. They're shutting down prayer camps and canceling climate negotiations. Nothing is changing. I'm sick of being patient. I'm sick of them and their complacence. The time we wasted with money chasing. Now there's poison in the water basin. Blood on the concrete, cops taking black lives. Someone's father, someone's son, that's more than just a black life. My flags are upside down, democracy is threatened. The youth are crying for help, but still they fail to listen. Fires on the mountainside, rising of the seas. My people sick of oppression, so we take it to the streets. The power of the people is more powerful than people in power. Faced with the end, with our lives and legacy on the line, you're telling me there's no time deciding our own fate. I believe that this will be our finest hour. I said the power of the people is more powerful than people in power. I believe this will be our finest hour. Thank you. I just put out my debut album like three days ago. 
So all y'all should pull out the Spotify, the SoundCloud, Apple Music. <laughs> Uh, download that show with the homies. Songs about revolution and movements, about this life, this crazy life we live in. Um, Earth Guardians is a massive movement worldwide that you have the opportunity to plug into and get involved with. Feel free to come and chat with me afterwards. I'm gonna be doing like some book signing, taking some questions. Thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time out of your day to come and kick it. Remember, small pieces of resistance lead to global shit. And I'll be dealing with each and every one of them. So. Thank you for your time and energy. And yeah, RedGuardians.org is a movement. Follow me on social media. I'm going on tour in a couple of weeks too, in like 25 cities across the country. So come see the show. Come back next time I'm speaking around. And um, catch you guys soon. Appreciate y'all.